Hold my hand Inside your hands Come to the teachings of St. Paul in the New Testament to see what he means by marriage, celibacy, chastity in marriage, uh, how the husbands should love the wives and what should the wives reciprocate this love with, what's the meaning of headship of the man and what is the meaning of submission of the woman. Um, lots of very interesting points that we need to go through together. But before we go to St. Paul, I just want to read a beautiful uh, part written by St. John Chrysostom and you will find it in his uh, homily 12 on the epistle to Colossi and in the Nicene and post-Nicene father, uh, Fathers. You find it in the first series, volume 13, which is one of those for John Chrysostom, page 319. What does he say? Listen and enjoy that. And how become they one flesh? As if you should take away the purest part of gold and mingle it with another gold. So, in truth, here. Also, the woman, as it were, receiving the richest part of the man, fused with pleasure, nourishes it and cherishes it, and with all contributing her own share, restores it back to a man, the child. And the child is a sort of a bridge that joins them both. Their coming together has this effect. It diffuses and commingles the bodies of both. And as one who has cast ointment into oil, that is perfume into perfume, has made the whole one, so in truth is it also here. And then he adds a very important statement. I know that many are ashamed at what is said. And the cause of this is what, is what I spoke of. Your own uncleanliness and unchastiness. Your own sexual repression in modern terms. For marriage is honorable and the bed is undefiled. And he said these words in the epistle to the Hebrews. Why are you ashamed of the honorable? Why do you blush at the undefiled? This is for heretics. Now, can you see how beautiful these words are? And then he adds and says, I wish to show you that you ought not to be ashamed at these things, but at those which you do. I mean, your other sins. You condemn God who has decreed, ordained these matters. He means the sexual relationship, the sexual intercourse and the sexual pleasure as we've read in the previous sentences. And then he ends by saying, let's not cast shame upon so great a mystery. Marriage is a type of the presence of Christ. And in another saying he said, If marriage were a thing to be condemned, would St. Paul have called Christ and the Church a bride and a bridegroom? Very interesting. We've discussed these points when we were also reading the Song of Songs and we understood that the Holy Spirit inspires lots of words and has already done so about the beauty and the purity of sex, love and marriage when it is lived in the proper way. The seventh chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians is a most important chapter about the opinions of St. Paul regarding marriage and celibacy and it should be read very carefully. The first verse starts by saying, now for the matters you wrote about and in the annotated Bible and in the new uh, international version after the word about, there is a colon, two dots. In other words, now about what you wrote to me about, and he is saying, now I will quote what you requested of me or what your question was. It is good for a man not to marry. And let's stop at this verse, because there is something most interesting in the Good News Bible to look at. 
This is the Good News Bible version by the Catholic Church because it also includes the deuterocanonical chapters and books and it gives us a very interesting insight about the first verse. Look with me at the bottom here and read carefully what is written. In other words, he's trying to say that first verse in chapter 7 could very well mean that you say to me, you Corinthians say that it is not good or it is good for a man not to marry. But I say to you, and that is how the second verse starts. Why is this point very important? Because some people believe that the reading of this first verse should mean that St. Paul is suggesting that it is good for a man not to marry. But the way it is written in the Greek has the possible interpretation as we've seen and as interpreters and Bible scholar have, scholars have written it in annotated Bibles in the New uh, International Version and in the Good News Bible by attributing that statement, it is good for a man not to marry not to St. Paul, but to the Corinthians themselves. Indeed, if you read the whole chapter carefully, you'll find that it is, in a sense, a reply in the negative by St. Paul. He is talking to them, and you need to know the background of that, that the Corinthians and parts of Greece and the Middle East, as I said before, were very deeply affected by Gnosticism. Manichaeism had not actually started. It started in the 3rd century onwards. But the Gnosticism which is the platonic uh, development of what Plato said, and I discussed that in another video clip before, made them dislike or feel that marriage and sexual relations are somehow not that clean. It's uh, as uh, in the book of the Sacrament of Love, and I hope I'll have a chance to read some of its uh, quotations to you, that marriage at some stages in the history of the church was seen as a tolerated exception. Not really bad or ugly, but not that pure and wonderful as we've been discussing uh, looking through the Bible and as St. John Chrysostom has just said. So St. Paul was trying to talk to these people. Now, if the first question they were telling him is, uh, look, St. Paul, we believe that it is not good for a man uh, to be married in a sense. It is better to be celibate, isn't it? He understands what's going into the minds because he understands the social context and environment and what's going on in the minds. So he doesn't want really to tell them, listen, all what you say is wrong. So he's trying to give them some permission, as we will read here, that if they want to separate for short periods with a condition that it is with the agreement of both partners and for a limited defined period they can separate from one another and abstain from sexual relations for such a um, uh, period of worship and prayer, a retreat. What they used to do at that time is, if somebody is not so interested in his wife or the other way around, they will just make an excuse. Oh, uh, listen, I've got a week to go for a retreat. And as you see, that, that's worshipping God. Huh? You can't argue against this, can you? And they take this as an excuse and leave the spouse uh, feeling frustrated and unhappy because there was no clear agreement about it. And they used to do this because in the mind and subconscious, as I said, marriage was not that clean enough, not that good enough. And sexual relationships were something that they thought probably just to have kids, as some children think it, it mom and dad just had sex two, three times to have the two, three children.